we can turn these in your scriptures to the book of First Thessalonians, chapter 2, beginning at verse 17, reading through to chapter 3, verse 5. You can see the sermon is entitled The Heart of the Pastor, Desire and Action. And you might think I specifically picked it for today. Well, in God's providence, this is what we've got. This is what I'm preaching in Geneva tonight as I work my way through Thessalonians. So I do double duty today. May the Lord be pleased to add his blessing both to the reading and the preaching. Well, let's turn our attention to God's word. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 17, reading through to chapter 3 and verse 5. Let us hear God's holy word. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavoured the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you. I call again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's co-worker in the Gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in your faith, that no one may be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as it has come to pass, pass and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you, and our labour would be in vain. Amen. Thanks be to God. What is it that makes a faithful pastor? What is it that makes a faithful under-shepherd of the flock of the Lord Jesus Christ? We might be able to identify many issues. Uh, theological exactness and purity and ability to preach or teach. But the Apostle Paul, by way of example, lays before us a paradigm of Christian ministry and service. We see in this text, by example, and implicitly we observe, you see, the Apostle's desire and his ensuing action. His desire and his actions on behalf of the church at Thessalonica. We see here with Paul, not just with Paul, but also with Silas and Timothy, who co-write the letter with him, we see a deep-rooted love for the flock of Jesus Christ. A deep-rooted love for the flock and sending out of that love an activity towards the flock. And it's an activity which is selfless. It is, in fact, self-sacrificing. And all the more so as the Apostle Paul has fears for the spiritual state of the brethren in the church at Thessalonica. We observe in this text the desire, the heart, the love that exists between the under-shepherds and the flock, and the activity of the under-shepherds on behalf of the flock. And so the Holy Spirit is teaching us today not only a paradigm of pastoral care, not only the pattern of pastoral care, but why pastoral care is necessary. God has ordained pastoral care. God has ordained the under-shepherds in his church for a purpose. That is, so that the saints might be kept against the attacks of Satan. And so we're observing two things. We're observing the pattern of pastoral life for all under-shepherds, and we're also observing why God has ordained the offices of elder and of pastor. In verses 17 to 20, we observe Paul, when I say Paul, I'm speaking, I'm using 
verbal shorthand for Paul, Silas, and Timothy, we observe Paul's desire, that is, to be with his brethren, to be with them. And then we observe in chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, Paul's activity that springs out of his desires, that is, in sending Timothy to be with the brethren. First, we Paul's desire, verses 17 to 20 of chapter 2. Paul begins this section recalling the separation that took place between Paul, Silas, and Timothy and the church at Thessalonica. Uh, bear in mind the history of this. Act 17 is where we're at in the planting of the church at Thessalonica. Paul and Silas and Timothy go to Thessalonica. They go to the synagogue. They reason and they explain, writes Luke, they reason and explain that Jesus was the Christ and that Jesus must suffer. And through their proclamation of the gospel, many Greeks are converted to the faith. And yet that raises the ire of the Jews. And so the Jews form a rabble, they incite the rabble, uh, riotous men, they attack the house of Jason, and they bring the civil authorities against the Christian converts and start to persecute them. Paul is sent on his way by the believers. Uh, his safety, the progress of the gospel, had temporarily been halted at this point. And Paul describes that separation, Paul is sent on to Berea. He describes that separation here in these words. He says, we were torn away from you. We were torn away from you. Literally, he says in Greek, we were orphaned. He describes this separation in familial terms, which if you know Thessalonians, is no surprise. Chapter 2, verse 7, he's already said that his relationship with the church was as a nursing mother taking care of his children. And then in verse 11 of the same chapter, he's also said that his relationship to the church was as if he was an exhorting father instructing his children. Now Paul says, well, where the children? And in being torn away from you, we have been orphaned. What does Paul say? He said that he has lost family. In the physical separation, as he sent on to Berea, Acts 17, verse 10, he feels like he's been bereaved. He's lost something so profound and so special, he feels like he has been bereaved. Almost as if he has lost his parents, he's lost his family. Why does he feel this way? Because he's part of the family. He's part, you see, of the family of God. A structure, an organism, which will survive longer than the bonds of blood or marriage. He's part of an organization which will last to eternity. And that organization, listen to this, is bound together in love. It's bound together in love. And that's why he is grieved that he cannot be, as you see, with them face to face. He's separated with them. Their hearts have been knit together in love. And we see the manner of that love when we read Paul's description of their separation. He says, uh, we have been torn away from you, brothers, for a short time in person, not in heart. Notice that in person, not in heart. Some of you will know the experience of going on trips without members of your family, maybe for business, maybe I know this with General Assembly. You go away for a week, eight days, and you're missing your family. And there's something incomplete about you for those eight days. There's a separation, even though it's ordained by God, there's a separation between you and your loved ones. And there's a yearning to be back with them. To, to hold them, to hug them, to love them, to see their smiling faces. That's what Paul is saying here. He's been separated not in heart, but only physically. You see, when I come back from my trips from General Assembly, I'm returning to a situation I know well, in which I am loved and I share love. Why? Because God has ordained my family. God has ordained my family, 
and the ties which bind us together. In like manner, God has ordained the ties which bind the church of Jesus Christ together. They are God ordained. Our unity is in his Son, Jesus Christ. And so it is no small unity that exists between believers. Paul's heart has been knit together in love for the brethren. This under shepherd who planted the church and then quickly, quickly left says that he has a great and deep desire and love for the brethren. So great that time after time he had endeavoured to return to Thessalonica. That's what he says there in verse 17. We endeavour the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, verse 18, because we wanted to come to you. You see, the words of desire mount up to the knocks. Literally, he says, even more eagerly, face to face, because he's already used that word in the Greek once already, he says, we've been separated for a short time, in face, literally, not in heart. Now he comes back, well, the words, and says, we want to see you face to face. That's when our joy is made complete, is when we're in your presence. He says, even more eagerly, face to face, with great desire. Here's a pastor, an under shepherd, an elder who loves the flock. And by all accounts, the flock loved him also. I guess they didn't have enough time to find out whether they disliked him, because he had to move on. But nonetheless, there is a mutual love of a profound order between these Brethren. And because they're separated, notice this, because they're separated, and I think you can apply this to any kind of separation between brethren, whether it's an emotional, or spiritual, whether it's physical, because there is separation, Paul has an even greater desire to remove that separation or the cause of separation. We endeavoured, we worked hard. We were eager. We had a great desire. We wanted to come to you. To put behind us that which separated us, which in this case was simply distance and the providence of God. And Paul is all the more desirous as a shepherd of the flock to be with this church. Why? Because they're under threat. They're in danger. There's a warfare. Satan is prowling and tempting. They're facing affliction, they're facing persecution, and the shepherd wants to be with the flock in order to protect them and care for them. Paul says, verse 18, we wanted to come to you. And then he inserts a personal note in there. He says, I, Paul, again and again, literally both once and twice, we wanted to come to you. I desired to be with you. I tried. But Satan hindered them. <coughs> Brethren, this is not a fleeting desire of the under shepherd towards the flock. This is not something that is passing. It's not something that Paul's going to get over pretty soon. This is an aspect of his heart, his desire for the flock of Christ. He loves them and misses them and fears for them. Now, brethren, is this just a description of what Paul was feeling at this time? Or is there something of a prescription here? What's the difference? Many Christians today read the book of Acts and they see that the church met in homes. And they say, well, okay, they met in homes. We need to meet in homes as well. All that means is that they didn't have any buildings at that time. They're new converts. It's just a description of where they met. It's not a prescription. It's not law. It's not legislating how the church should meet. Is this just a description of Paul's affection? Or does it lay down for us something more than that? I think it does. I think it lays out for us the paradigm of the pastoral heart. It lays down for us the pattern of the desire and the love of the under shepherd for the flock. And we see it here in an example. Paul, the under shepherd, seeks to be with the flock 
in order that his love for them may be expressed towards them, and he might care for them. Now consider who we have here. We've got Paul, Silas, and Timothy, two Hebrews, or two Jews, and a Greek. And he's ministering to a group of people, as you see in chapter 1, verse 9, who are a bunch of pagans. By and large, Greeks, probably some Jews in there with them, how do two Jews and a Greek now come to be expressing such an intimate and heartfelt love to a bunch of pagan Gentiles whom they previously did not know? How is it? It's because they're brethren in Christ. And Paul and Silas and Timothy know personally and experientially the mercy of God in Christ Jesus. And so when people, no matter who they are, are converted to the faith and join the family of God, they become, spiritually speaking, bone of Paul's bone and flesh of his flesh. They become one. <clears throat> Why? Because all these people, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, and the Thessalonian church, they all know Christ and are united to Jesus Christ. And importantly, Paul knew that what he was doing now was simply an extension of the work of Jesus Christ. Notice that. Paul, as an under-shepherd, is an extension of the work of of Jesus Christ. Brethren, that's so very important for us to understand. God has given gifts, Christ has given gifts to the church. Apostle, prophets, pastors, teachers, elders. Elders and ministers serve on behalf of Jesus Christ, administering the love and care of Christ into the Father. So you may never be called to be elders, have a high and a lofty task set before you. You are called to administer the work of Jesus Christ in his church. And members, and we are all members of one body in the church or another, it is to your peril, your grave peril, as we'll see in a moment, to ignore the care and authority of Jesus Christ as it comes to you through the under-shepherds of the church. To ignore the care and the authority of Christ, sorry, of the under-shepherd, is in fact to ignore the care and authority of Jesus himself. Now what would it take for such intense desires what would it take for such a noble calling to be thwarted in the case of Paul? He says this, Satan hindered us. Yes, that's what it would take. It would take a hindrance of supernatural proportions to stop Paul returning to the Thessalonian brethren. He says there, Satan hindered us. What's the nature of that hindrance? Well, we know going back to Acts 17, we can read of the situation whereby uh, Jason's house is attacked, uh, the civil authorities take a bond or a security, a financial security from Jason, and they're saying to him basically, if these men come back and preach the gospel, then you will forfeit your bond, your security. And so what happens is Paul is sent on his way. The, the proclamation of the gospel in Thessalonica comes in a sense to a premature end. And now, subsequently, Paul has been hindered. He cannot go back, or Jason will forfeit his bond. And that's the nature of that's the nature of the hindrance. But we need to go deeper than that, do we not? The hindrance is just not a financial issue. It's not just a matter of Jason. The hindrance, you see, is according to the wise counsel. Of God. Yes, actually, God is in charge of this hindrance. In the sovereign providence of God, this hindrance, Paul being reunited with the brethren, this hindrance took place. Why? So that the Thessalonian brethren might be tested and proven. 
so that the apostles' love and desire and activity may be tested and proven. If we didn't have this hindrance, we wouldn't have the book of Thessalonians. So the hindrance is for your blessing also, that we now have this epistle before us. But God uses means, does he not? And his means are singular. Paul says that equivocally, Satan hindered us. He stopped us. But Satan is a means that God uses. We need to understand here, brethren, as mighty as Satan is, Satan's power and authority are under the control of the Almighty God. And Satan is but a means, an instrument, in the hands of Almighty God for God to work out his purpose. Yes, Satan has a purpose here. It's for evil. It's to silence the gospel. It's to remove the gospel from Thessalonica. But God has a greater purpose. Because it will have with God be behind this hindrance. In a sense, they close down the, the witness there in Thessalonica. But not so. The church of Thessalonica had been planted. It was in place. So we're called to look very hard at provinces. We are called to be good readers of provenance. We don't see Paul being separated from the brethren as the end of the matter. We don't see that as Satan having gained the victory. We see it as another step in God's sovereign and perfect and wise will being outworked in the life of his church. Yes, it's a minor setback at one level. At another level, look what blessing accrues from this setback. We're called to look at providence, brethren, even when Satan's hand is very clear in it, and not see Satan's hand chiefly, but we're called to see the hand of our sovereign God, doing all things well, doing all things for the sake of his church. But notwithstanding that perspective that God is sovereign, we must also be mindful, brethren, that this hindrance is real. It's painful. You can hear it in Paul's writing. We want to be with you. We can't. We've been separated. It hurts. And these hindrances, these provinces do hurt. Make no mistake. The various trials that this church or that every Christian or every Christian family faces, they hurt. But what is their goal? Their goal is God's goal. It's for the perfecting of the saints. It's that the word may go forth in different ways. Paul speaks here in verse 19 of a hope, a joy, a crown, a boasting. I've not got time to major on this right now. He's saying the Thessalonian church were so concerned for you. And remember, by the way, you are the evidence of our work. And you will be the evidence of our work at the coming of Christ. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting, that's the laurel wreath in the Roman Empire, before our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? The shepherds of the flock have something personally invested in the flock. It is their crown of boasting at the coming of Jesus Christ. Their standing, the Thessalonians' standing in the faith, is paramount to Paul. Not just because he loves them, primarily because he loves them, but also they are a testimony to the work that he has done. So we see this desire on behalf of Paul, Silas, and Timothy, this great desire, a desire of love, a desire of unity, to be with each other, a desire to protect the flock. Now that desire has feet, so to speak. It acts. Paul doesn't sit back and say now, well, for this reason we pray to Almighty God that he... No, he actually acts in accordance with his desires. And brethren, every single one of us does that every day. We act in accordance with our desires. If our desires are rotten, so will our actions. Paul's actions, Paul's desires here, are holy and just and good. And so too is the ensuing action. Chapter 3, verse 1. What does Paul do? He sends Timothy to the brethren. Now you'll notice this. Paul restates the depth of his emotion when we could bear it no longer. Chapter 3, verse 1. We were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother. 
Notice the activity. Paul, Silas, and Timothy are working together, encouraging each other. And yet he says, your need is greater than ours. Though we have a need, we are willing to be left in Athens alone in order that Timothy can come to you and do the work of the pastor. We're willing, in other words, says Paul, to sacrifice. To sacrifice the work of Timothy with us so that he might go back to you, the church that he helped plant, and minister to you, and strengthen you, and establish you. That's precisely what he says in verse 2. In order to establish and exhort you in faith. Why? Because he knows there's danger. He knows there's danger. Twice he mentions it. So that no one of you might be moved by these afflictions. Verse 3. And again in verse 5. For fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you. Willing to sacrifice his own desires and needs. That is the companionship and work of Timothy. And send them back to the church. The action here is this. It is a self-sacrificial action of giving. That's what shepherds and the shepherds do. That's what David the shepherd did when he was attacked or his flock was attacked by a bear or a lion. He put his life in the way. That's what Paul is also doing here. He is giving up what he has in order that the flock might be profited. Now who is he sending? He's sending Timothy. Remarkable young man. But look how he describes him. This is the most remarkable description, I think, perhaps anywhere in Scripture. We said Timothy, verse 2, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ. God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ. Just let that sink in for one moment. Timothy is God's co-worker. Not my co-worker, Paul's co-worker, God's co-worker. Not only is he speaking here of the caliber of Timothy, of his character, his desires, his actions, and so on, but he's speaking also about his office, and his authority, and the responsibility that comes with that office. But Timothy's not a co-worker of Paul, though he is. He's a co-worker of God himself. To what end? That he might do the work of God. That he might do the work of Christ. That is, in establishing and exhorting the Thessalonians in their faith. Is it not remarkable that Timothy, this young man, God's co-worker, is sent back to Thessalonica as he works alongside God in the building of the kingdom, as God works through him in the protection of the flock. You know, an inactive shepherd, under shepherd, is a poor reflection on his co-worker. That is, an inactive shepherd, under shepherd, is a poor reflection on God. Why is Paul taking this enormous step, this step of self-sacrifice? It's because he's aware of the danger. Let no one be moved by these afflictions. There is a danger. It's a danger that the Thessalonians face, and it's a danger which every single one of us in this room today faces on a daily and a weekly basis either through affliction or through temptation, or both, as they are conjoined together in the work of Satan. Every single one of you, you must know this surely, is in a spiritual battle. Every single one of you is waging warfare, at least if you're not, then you're going to be soon to be a casualty of that war. You're called elsewhere by the Holy Spirit to put on the whole armour of God. That is dress for battle. Why? Because you're at war. You're at war with the world. You're at war with sin which resides within you. 
you're at war with a world that hated your master and equally hates you. You see, persecution, brethren, has a habit of making us question those things we previously once held very close to us. These pagan Christians who had converted out of uh, idol worship in chapter 1 verse 9 and so on, now they're facing the threat of danger to their souls, or at least threat of danger to their bodies. And Paul says there is a corresponding threat to their soul. Persecution has the habit of making us question our convictions. Am I right to trust God? I mean, after all, look what's happening to me. All the trials that I'm facing, all the troubles that I have. See, persecution makes us question whether Jesus Christ is in fact the right way and the only way. Persecution and trouble make us question whether God will care for us in all our needs. And it tempt, tempts us, if not to abandon our faith, but to compromise our faith. That's the reality. Temptation is there to draw us away. But Paul reminds the Thessalonians there in verse 3 and verse 4, and he does so emphatically when he says, For you yourselves, it's an emphatic construction there in the Greek, you yourselves know that we are destined for this. In other words, Paul is saying, look, we told you this would happen. But when you receive Christ, you enter into Christ's life. And he's reminded them, back in Acts 17, as he reasoned and explained that as the Christ had to suffer, so also will those who follow him. Because a servant is not greater than his master. He says, you yourselves know. Part of being a Christian is taking up the cross. It is suffering for the sake of Christ. Suffering for the sake of the gospel. In other words, he's saying, this is not news to you. We told you this at the time, and now look, verse 4, it's happening. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as it had come to pass, and just as you know. Suffering, you see, brethren, is a necessary aspect of the Christian life. Because as it was with our master, so must it also be with the servant. Suffering for the sake of the gospel in your family, your workplace, your neighborhoods, wherever it might be, is a necessary aspect of Christian life. In fact, it is a validating aspect of Christian life. That is to say, if we suffer for the sake of the gospel, it shows us that we belong to Christ. And we're walking in his footsteps after him. And so Paul reiterates there in verse 5, For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. He sends Timothy to them, to establish them to encourage them, in order that their faith may not be in vain. You know what he's saying there, don't you? In case some of you commit apostasy and turn from Christ, never to be returned to him. Because in the case of the apostate, there is no repentance of apostasy. Paul said this is a matter not of Jason's bond or Jason's household or being roughed up. This matter of affliction and persecution and temptation is in fact a matter of your eternal well-being. And look what Paul's saying to them. He's saying, listen, I'm your under-shepherd, and I'm here to guard you, and this is what we're going to do. We're sending Timothy to you, that he might strengthen you in the hour of need. Let's wrap this together very quickly. We ought to pause, consider not only the Thessalonians, but consider also ourselves. Granted, at the moment, we don't have anyone beating down those doors, coming in here, persecuting us. We have great freedom in this country, God-given freedom. I'm not talking about political freedom, I'm talking about freedom to worship 
And yet, is it not the case, brethren, that such blessings of Almighty God, that is freedom to worship, can easily become hindrances to those who do not keep their eye on the ball? Freedoms and blessings, so often, <coughs> when you treat them as common things and not as blessings of God, have the habit of becoming snares to us. We often allow blessings, do we not, brethren, to become commonplace, to become things of comfort to us. And in so doing, we've lost sight of the reality that we, as the Church of Jesus Christ, are at war. Satan is a hinderer. Satan, from this text, is a tempter. This is the battle, brethren, that is before each one of us. Yet if your suffering, brethren, is for the sake of the gospel, you ought not despise it. Peter and John, when released from prison, counted it all joy that they were found, what? Worthy to suffer for the sake of Christ. If you haven't experienced it yet, you most certainly will at some point in your life. The hatred of Satan and the hatred of a world that hates Christians. Perhaps in your workplaces, you're tempted to run with the crowd, cut corners, compromise. You must stand firm, even if that means you suffer. Perhaps in your extended families, at certain times of the year, at family gatherings, things go on that you don't approve of. And you take the easy route out because you know you don't want to upset your family. Uh, that, that's not standing firm for Christ. We're called not to bow the knee to anyone. In our neighbourhoods, wherever we find ourselves, brethren, you must stand out. If you belong to Christ, you must, by necessity, stand out. Let your light so shine, said our Lord. Jesus Christ. And so we conclude, brethren, suffering is a, an integral part of the Christian life. It, it's absolutely necessary to us because it shows us that we have that true, that sincere, that vital union with Jesus Christ himself. And so what has God given us that we might withstand in the time of of trial. He's given us his co-workers. Men called to office to be co-workers with God. Elders, pastors, must shepherd. And you'll only shepherd if you love the flock. And so if you find your love waning, dear brethren, who are elders, or those who will be future elders, one thing you ought to be doing now is praying that God will give you a love for the flock of Jesus Christ. You're his co-workers, you're his ambassadors, you're the under-shepherds of Jesus Christ. If you have Christ's heart, that will lead you to self-sacrificial service. A congregation, it's undoubtedly as easy in this church as it is in my church to point your finger at the under-shepherds of the flock and say just what a rotten job they're doing. It happens everywhere. And yet how many of you are praying for them? How many of you are praying for them that these men who are God's co-workers, who have enormous loads of care and burden placed on their shoulders, that they will equip themselves well, that they will be faithful, that they'll be honorable men, wise men, sensitive men. How many of you are praying for them? And moreover, how many of you are submitting to them? I'm not thinking about these men now generally, of course, in our midst. We'll be voting on a pastoral candidate today also. These men are keeping watch over your souls. Yes! Watch over your souls. God has said to you today, your own watch is insufficient. You need men to keep watch over your soul. Otherwise, God would not have ordained the under-shepherds to be the under-shepherds. Because Satan is wicked, and persecution, and suffering, and trial are hard in your lives. You need the under-shepherds of the flock.
You want your watchmen, the men who stand on the gates of Zion, do you want them to sleep? Or do you want them awake? Pray for them. Remember, brethren, they're God's co-workers. Ignore their counsel at your peril. And men who are shepherds here today you must love the flock. And you must let that love show. In fact, if you do love, there's absolutely no way that you can possibly hide that love. It will be manifested. Brethren, we're part of Jesus Christ's church, not your own church. And that means we play by Jesus' rules. Whether you stand behind a pulpit or in front of it, it matters not. We're all knit together, are we not? We are, in fact, bone of each other's bone, flesh of each other's flesh. Let us look to Christ. Because this is what we see here in this text, actually, is nothing more than a reflection of Christ's care for his flock being outworked through the Apostle, through Silas, through Timothy. We don't put our trust in men. We don't put our trust in princes. We put our trust in Christ Jesus. He is the head of his church. And so, brethren, as we bear that in mind, let us, as Paul says elsewhere, endeavour, endeavour to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Why? Because we're brethren. We're part of God's family. And if there can't be peace and unity here, then where can it be? Let us then, brethren, do that. Endeavour to keep the unity of the Spirit in a bond of peace. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Father, you are very glorious and we bless your name. We worship you and praise you for Christ our Lord, who himself is the good shepherd. And to him we look. And yet, Lord, we also give you thanks that in his wisdom and in your wisdom you have ordained office in your church, that your people might be guarded and kept, that Jesus Christ might work through these offices in his church. Grant us then, Lord God, loose necks, not stiffened, soft hearts, not proud hearts, open ears, not stopped ears, that we might hear what your Spirit has to say to his church this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's close up one.